Hello everyone, welcome to your mini lecture. Today we're going to be covering expectancy theory. And expectancy theory is important because it really tells us whether or not employees are going to be motivated to direct their effort toward a given task or assignment. So remember, uh, one of the key components of motivation is where are you going to put your effort? Where will you direct uh, your time and energy? So if you want to understand whether or not someone is even going to begin working on a task, if somebody is motivated to actually start a task or put time and energy into a task, uh, you would use expectancy theory to tell you um, or to make an educated guess. So uh, by definition, when we're talking about expectancy theory, uh, essentially we're saying employees are motivated uh, to work on a task when they believe they can accomplish a task and the rewards for doing so are worth the effort. So basically, somebody has to believe that they are capable of completing a task successfully, and they have to believe that the outcome they get for doing that task is going to be worth um, the effort or it's going to be valuable to them. So expectancy theory is actually made up of three different um, components and it's based on employees' perceptions. So what that means is when we're talking about expectancy theory, it's not about what reality is. It's about what an employee perceives to be true. So if an employee perceives that they are able to do a task or they perceive that they're not able to do a task, it's going to influence their motivation regardless of if those perceptions are true or not. So if you've ever heard the old adage, perception is reality, uh, that certainly applies here with, um, as a manager, we need to assess the situation from the employee's perspective in order to understand whether or not they are likely to be motivated. So um, there are three different perceptions that are included in expectancy theory, uh, and they are called expectancy, instrumentality, and valence. We are going to go through each of these three perceptions on the next couple of slides and explain uh, what these mean. So again, just to underscore, when we're talking about expectancy theory, we can use this theory to tell us where employees are going to direct their effort. So we're going to start by looking at that first perception called expectancy. And expectancy says, um, basically, it's looking at the employee's perception of his or her ability to accomplish a task. So does a person think they are able to accomplish a task? So an employee will ask themselves, do I have the ability to do this task that you're asking of me? If I believe I have the ability to perform the task, I'm going to feel motivated. On the other hand, if I perceive that I don't have the ability to perform a task, I'm not going to be motivated. Uh, and really, this might make sense to you from a personal standpoint if you can think about maybe some activities or assignments that you perceive to be weaknesses that you're not very good at, uh, you might not like doing those things, right? In general, we like to do activities or tasks that we're good at that makes us feel good about ourselves. So if we perceive that we're not good at something, we generally don't enjoy it. And as a result, we're not going to feel motivated um, to perform that task. So again, with expectancy theory, the first piece is that an employee must perceive that they have the ability to do a task. So um, what then shapes whether or not somebody perceives that they are able to complete a task? Well, it turns out um, there is a, a variable that is called self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is defined as the belief that a person has the capabilities needed to execute the behaviors required for task success. So if a person has high self-efficacy, they believe they're able to execute the behaviors that are needed for a given assignment or task, um, then they're going to have high expectancy. They're going to believe that um, they have the ability to do what's being asked of them. 
there are four factors that go into someone's self-efficacy. Uh, the first one is called past accomplishments. So basically, uh, a person is going to look at how they've performed in the past on similar tasks, and that's going to help shape whether or not um, they have high or low self-efficacy. So imagine that you are asked to write a paper um, for a class. You might look at how you've done in the past writing papers in other classes. Uh, if you've been successful at writing papers in other classes, then you might have high self-efficacy. However, if you're someone who feels as though they've struggled in the past writing essays, um, then you might feel as though you have low self-efficacy for that assignment. Individuals will also um, consider vicarious experiences, and this shapes their self-efficacy. So by vicarious experiences, what we mean is we look at what happens to other people and how they've performed um, a similar task. So oftentimes, students will look at um, other students in the classroom and see how they've performed, and then they use that to either um, believe they can do something or not believe they can do something. So if you're looking around and everyone around you is doing well on an examination, uh, then you might believe you too can do well on the examination because other people are showing that it's possible. The third component of self-advocacy is called verbal persuasion. And this uh, is basically what it sounds like. It's when other people tell you that you can do it. So let's say that you uh, have to do a written assignment, but you're maybe you're feeling unsure about it and you, you email me to ask and I say, you can absolutely do it. You are really smart. You're a great student. You can write this assignment. I believe in you. Uh, you have what it takes. Right? Someone else showing confidence in you and expressing their belief that you're able to do something uh, can be uh, very helpful in shaping our self-efficacy beliefs. So if other people think we can do it, uh, then we tend to also believe that we can do it. The last component of self-efficacy is called emotional cues. And emotional cues uh, basically is how your body tells you um, how you're feeling about a task at hand. So let's say that you have a project that's due at the end of the semester. If every time you think about that project, your stomach aches, or you get really anxious, or you just have like a sinking feeling um, in your gut, right? That basically tells you that you're lacking some self-efficacy, right? Your body's giving you some cues um, that maybe are signaling whether or not you're feeling confident. Um, on the other hand, if we think about um, Perhaps let's say you have a job interview coming up and when you think about the interview, you're excited, um, you feel happy or hopeful, right? These are some emotional cues um, that are, are positive and that are telling you that you um, have high self-efficacy, that you believe you'll be able to do well on that interview. So again, just to recap here, expectancy theory has three components. The first is called expectancy. So basically, this is if an, em an employee believes they have the ability to do something, then they're going to feel motivated to do it. So what shapes expectancy beliefs? Well, this is the uh, variable called self-efficacy. So if individuals have high self-efficacy, they'll also have high expectancy. And there are four things that go into creating self-efficacy, right? We just talked about each one of these. So what I'm going to do now is just show you a quick video. Uh, and I want you to watch this video and imagine that you're a student in the classroom and, um, and consider whether or not you would have high or low self-efficacy uh, after watching the video. So, okay, here we go. Dr. Cooper, forget it. <laughs> Excuse me. Sheldon, we both agreed to do this. It's a waste of time. I might as well explain the laws of thermodynamics to a bunch of labradoodles. <laughs> if you don't do this, I won't take you to the comic book store. 
Hello. Nice work with the laser, by the way. <clears throat> Looking out at your fresh young faces, I remember when I too was deciding my academic future as a lowly graduate student. Of course, I was 14. <laughs> And I already achieved more than most of you could ever hope to, despite my nine o'clock bedtime. <laughs> now, there may be one or two of you in this room who has what it takes to succeed in theoretical physics, although it's more likely that you will spend your scientific careers teaching fifth graders how to make paper mache volcanoes of baking soda lava. <laughs> oh, good God. In short, Anyone who told you that you would someday be able to make any significant contribution to physics played a cruel trick on you, a cruel trick indeed. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> uh, of course not. <laughs> I weep for the future of science. Now, if you'll excuse me, the latest issue of Batman is out. Hey, guys. Hey, Leslie. Okay, so uh, if we go back to considering self-efficacy and these different components, thinking about that video, uh, do you think the students in the classroom would have high self-efficacy for pursuing a graduate degree in science? Uh, and I would say probably not, right? So for one, uh, they're definitely lacking verbal persuasion. So in that clip, um, the speaker, Sheldon, is telling them uh, basically they're a bunch of labradoodles, they're not smart, <laughs> um, that, you know, they don't have what it takes. So something else is you can imagine the emotional cues you might feel. So if you're sitting in that room and someone's telling you your chances of success aren't very good, you're probably not going to be feeling um, very positive emotions that you might feel regret or anxiety or... Um, you know, maybe even disinterest. So these emotional cues are certainly going to um, impact self-efficacy. You might also consider um, Sheldon's experiences. He said when he was 12, he was already um, doing more than these individuals could ever possibly dream of doing. And so a person might consider um, their own past accomplishments and perceive, wow, I'm, I'm way far behind and I don't think that I can do it. So again, this is just a, a quick example of how self-efficacy is shaped and how it influences uh, our emotion or our motivation. The second uh, perception, the second component of expectancy theory is called instrumentality. And instrumentality is basically the belief that if someone performs a task, that it will result in them getting some outcome. Now, I know that this language is a bit vague, so just stick with me here and we will do some examples uh, when we get through uh, these different components. But again, keep in mind that the outcome doesn't have to be positive or negative. We're just saying, if I perform a task, then some outcome will occur. So again, if I perform the task well, if I do it successfully, will it result in some outcome? So if I believe that there is a link between my performance and some outcome, then it will lead to motivation. If on the other hand, uh, I think there is no link between how hard I work and some outcome, I'm not going to feel motivated. So imagine this. Imagine that you want to get a promotion in your organization. In order to have instrumentality, you must believe that if you work hard and you put in you know, the time and effort, then it will result in getting the promotion, right? So if you think that doing hard work and putting in good work will result in in getting the promotion, then you're going to feel motivated to work hard. If, on the other hand, you think that it doesn't matter how hard you work, it doesn't matter how much overtime you put in, or how you know often you go that extra mile, no matter what you do, you won't get chosen for the promotion. Then you're not going to feel motivated. So, there has to be this clear link between an employee's behavior and the perceived outcome. If they think that performing well, engaging in 
certain behaviors, if it doesn't link to an outcome, employees are not going to feel motivated. So you might consider, well, why, why might an employee not see a link between their behavior and an outcome? So imagine, again, that example of trying to get a promotion. Perhaps you work in an organization where um, it's the person who's been there the longest gets the promotion. And maybe you're new, and so you know that no matter how hard you work, it doesn't matter. You're never going to get the promotion because you haven't been there the longest. Uh, you might also work in an organization where there's a lot of um, you know, corporate politics going on, and it's not really about how hard you work, but more or less who you're friends with. So if you're friends with the boss, then uh, you'll get a promotion. But if you're not friends with the boss, you won't get a promotion. Uh, so in that example, again, it doesn't matter how hard you work. Um, you don't perceive that you're going to get the promotion if you're not friends with the boss. So uh, employees aren't gonna feel motivated to work hard uh, because they really don't see that link between behavior and outcome. The third component of expectancy theory is called valence. And valence looks at the outcome itself and whether or not that outcome is desirable. Is it valued by employees? So we look at the outcome and we say, is that outcome pleasurable or valuable? If it is, then we're going to feel motivated. And if it's not pleasurable or valuable, we're not going to feel motivated. So uh, what we do know is that outcomes will be more valuable when they fulfill employees' needs. So imagine this. Imagine your boss is trying to... Um, motivate employees to meet their sales goals. And if they meet their sales goals, they will get a coupon to McDonald's for free coffee. Is that motivating? Well, it's going to depend on the person. So if you're somebody who loves McDonald's and you love their coffee, uh, that might be a motivating tool. Uh, but if you're someone who doesn't drink coffee or you don't like McDonald's or really you think that's kind of a cheap, lame, um, you know, gift or reward for, for meeting your sales goals, then it's not going to feel motivating. So these outcomes are going to be valuable um, based on a person's need and based on a person's um, values. And so what we need to do as managers is really take a look at our employees, get to know our employees and, and recognize what it is that they find valuable and try to offer rewards or outcomes uh, that they find motivating. So for some individuals, that might mean a gift card. For some individuals, it might be a cash bonus. For some, it might be um, employee of the month, right? We have to find outcomes that are actually worth having. Uh, and then that is what is going to drive employees' uh, motivation. It's important to note that outcomes can be both intrinsically and extrinsically valuable. So we're talking about intrinsically valuable. Uh, these are things that make us feel good in, internally, right? So it might be feeling proud. It might be feeling like you're accomplished. It might be having um, self-confidence and really just... Um, feeling good about the work you're doing or finding the work itself enjoyable, uh, that is going to be an intrinsic reward. Uh, extrinsic um, outcomes are things that are given to us. They're external. So this would be um, getting a promotion, getting some kind of bonus, um, having your boss praise you in front of everybody, perhaps being employee of the month. Um, all of those are external outcomes or rewards, uh, and they're valuable to us because um, they're coming from some outside force. They're not coming from inside our being. So I want to um, underscore here that with expectancy theory, we have those three components, right? Um, expectancy, instrumentality, and valence. In order for an employee to put forth effort um, toward a task, they must have all three of those. So if any one of those uh, perceptions is zero, if it's lacking in any way, then they're not going to be motivated. 
So we need to have all three components in order for someone to feel motivated. So let's go through an example. So here's your scenario. Imagine that I offer you uh, the chance to earn one point extra credit for writing a four page paper. And I want to know, will my students feel motivated to direct their effort toward writing the paper? Are they even going to start writing this extra credit paper? Yes or no? So I can look at each of the components of expectancy theory uh, to figure it out. So with expectancy, again, the idea is do students think they're able to write a four page paper? Do they believe they can do it? Uh, and I would say overall, yes, most students probably believe that they can write a four page paper. Uh, for example, most of you are already writing three to four page papers for your assignments in this class. Uh, so you're showcasing that you have this skill, you are able to do it. The second component is instrumentality. So this is the link between the behavior, which is writing the paper, and the outcome, which is extra credit. So here the perception is do students think they will receive the one point if they write the paper? So I'm going to say yes. I hope that you would trust me and believe that if I say I'll give you extra credit, you'll actually get it. Um, and so here, most students would probably say yes. They think if they actually wrote the paper, uh, they would get the one point. Uh, and in particular, um, maybe students previously earned points for extra credit assignments and know that when I offer extra credit, they actually get the points um, for doing the work. Say if you went to the job fair uh, a couple of weeks ago, then you would know, yes, you got the points. So you would expect that to be the same now. The last component is valence. And this has to do with whether or not the outcome, which is the extra credit, is that valuable for students. So do students view one point of extra credit as valuable? I'm going to guess probably not uh, because one point is very, very low compared to the total points in this class. It's probably going to have almost zero impact on your grade. Uh, and to go out of your way to write a four page paper to get one point extra credit, um, probably not going to be perceived as worth the effort. So in this scenario, are students going to direct their effort toward writing the paper? Probably not no one's going to turn it in, okay? Uh, and again, remember, uh, if any one of these things is a no, if any one of these things is lacking, there is no motivation. So we need all three of them in order to be motivated. All right, consider this example. Let's say now I offer you the chance to earn 100 points of extra credit, uh, but now you need to write a 50-page paper. Will students feel motivated to direct their effort toward writing the paper? So if we consider expectancy, we're saying, do students think they're able to write a 50 page paper? My guess here is most students are going to say no. Um, 50 pages is really long. It's much longer than any assignment in this class. It's much longer probably than any paper you've done in your time in college. Uh, and I could see a lot of students having some doubt about their ability to write a 50 page paper. Instrumentality stays the same as the last example. So do students think they'll receive the 100 points if they write the paper? Again, I hope they would say yes, uh, that I'm a person of my word and um, that I'll actually give you that extra credit, right? And so in the past, you've, students have earned extra, you know, they've earned the points for extra credit. And so they, they see this link between if they do the behavior, they will, they will get the outcome. And then the last component is valence. And so this is asking, do students view 100 points of extra credit as valuable? And here I'm going to say, yeah, probably they are. Uh, 100 points is a significant amount of your total grade. Basically, you wouldn't have to do any of the quizzes <laughs> for this class at all. Um, it would make up for that. And so 100 points would be very worthwhile for students to obtain. So even though they might um, want the 100 points and perceive the 100 points as valuable, in this scenario, having a lack of self-efficacy, a lack of expectancy about being able to write the 50 page paper is going to keep students from feeling motivated um, to direct their effort towards writing the paper. 
Okay, so this is your overview of expectancy theory. Um, in the module that follows, I'm actually going to insert a um, practice quiz where I'll give you a couple more examples of expectancy theory so that you can test whether or not you're comfortable with each of these components. You will see questions about expectancy theory on your actual quiz for the week, so I really encourage you to make sure that you've read the textbook, that you've taken the practice quiz, and that you feel comfortable with these concepts before you take the actual quiz just to maximize um, your performance. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I think expectancy theory tends to be um, one of the more challenging theories in this class, but I'm happy to provide you additional examples or to work through these concepts together if you have questions. So please send me an email or we can meet via Zoom. I'm happy to fill in um, any questions that you have. Okay, so that's your mini lecture. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you are looking forward to covering the other three theories in the rest of the module. Everybody have a wonderful week ahead and I will um, be in touch with you soon. Bye!